The next item of business is a statement by Claire Hockey on Scotland's response to the mental health challenge of COVID-19. The Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Claire Hockey for up to 10 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We are all in the process of learning how to live with COVID-19. To say that a full national lockdown was tough is perhaps putting it mildly. But the introduction of temporary measures now will also be really challenging for people across the country. This shows that the road to recovery from this pandemic will not be linear. It will not be straightforward. We have all been through a lot. And that means the importance of mental health and well-being has never been clearer. It has been difficult enough to maintain good physical health during the pandemic and lockdown. But the experience will also have been immensely draining psychologically for many of us. I doubt there is a single one of us who hasn't thought of our own mental well-being or worried about others during some point in 2020. The effects could include feeling down or anxious. People might have needed to be signposted to support. There might have been levels of distress and there may also be cases of more serious mental illness. Throughout this year, mental health has continued to be an absolute priority for this government. We have been proactive in our approach, announcing a range of additional supports. And reflecting how fundamental this issue is, we have today published our transition and recovery plan for mental health. Given that the Parliament will debate new temporary measures straight after this statement, this focus on mental health and wellbeing is very apt. The document lays out this government's response to the mental health impacts of COVID-19 and it addresses the challenges that the pandemic has had and will continue to have on the population's mental health. I wanted to speak about the process of developing it. From the beginning, we have known it would be crucial to develop a full understanding of the mental health effects of this pandemic. In April, we established the Mental Health Research Advisory Group to ensure our response is led by a robust understanding of evidence and data. The advisory group has followed research developments closely across the globe and has provided us with timely and expert advice on how COVID-19 is impacting on mental health. As well as embedding evidence at the heart of our approach, we have been determined to work collaboratively. A prerequisite for us was to hear firsthand about the effects that the pandemic was having and we have striven to reach mutual agreement on key areas where we need to work, make work forward. We have done so through sustained engagement with the stakeholder group which has met regularly over the past six months and I extend my sincere thanks to everyone who has contributed to this work so passionately. Amongst others, this has included Sam H, the Mental Health Foundation, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the Mental Welfare Commission, Unison, Penumbra, Samaritans and Voices of Lived Experience. Echoing what we have heard, we have structured the document around key themes and I hope members will see that the plan is comprehensive, containing over 100 actions. To take just some examples, we have included sections on whole population mental health. We want everyone across Scotland to remain engaged and informed about mental well-being. This includes the critical importance of reducing stigma. And we have concentrated on how the pandemic may impact on employment. And this includes people in uncertain employment, those who might have been made unemployed as a result of lockdown, and those who are currently trying to find a job. We know that children and young people have been particularly affected and we have laid out a range of actions to respond to the needs of our young citizens. These cover emotional well-being, the support available in educational settings and the route into specialist mental health services where those are needed. And we also recognise that older people have been just as impacted. So we so have those who are at higher risk, either through longer term health conditions or a disability. Many of them have been shielding which has been exceptionally difficult. In all of these cases, we find that further targeted action is needed to support good mental wellbeing. And we know how important specialist mental health services are, and they will continue to be so. We have laid out our approach for the recovery and renewal of CAMS and psychological therapies, and this includes a programme of enhanced improvement support. We will also work with NHS boards to ensure that they are able to respond to any increase in demand over the coming months. We now have a unique opportunity to focus on improving the quality of these services and we will make use of data and evidence and of digital technology where it's appropriate.
and we will implement a set of quality standards. We also know how vital mental health services provided by others, including local authorities, health and social care partnerships and the third sector are, and they will continue to be central to how we meet demand going forward. Presiding officer, through the pandemic, we have driven national action. We have worked with partners to promote examples of good practice across the country. The Clear Your Head campaign has become nationally recognised. We've expanded NHS 24's mental health hub, so it's now providing telephone support for people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We've established mental health assessment centres. We've rolled out distress brief intervention programme on a national basis, and we've launched Promise, the national wellbeing hub for health and social care staff, unpaid carers, volunteers, and their family. The plan outlines how we will build on success stories like these. However, it's really important to recognise that what we have laid out in this document is not set in stone. The situation remains fluid, as developments this week have shown too clearly. I started by saying that the road to recovery will not be linear, and that is likely to mean different types of mental health need will emerge as time passes. This will be affected by the extent to which further targeted measures are needed. Our response as laid out in the plan will be flexible and adaptable. It will continue to evolve over the short, medium and long term, and it will continue to be informed by the work of the Mental Health Research Advisory Group. Our ongoing use of evidence and data will be key. <coughs> Excuse me. As well as our stakeholders, I would also like to thank members across the Chamber for their constructive input over the past few months. During the government statement on mental health in June, I listened carefully to the priorities that members raised. Those included the help available in schools, bereavement support, the importance of the third sector, and issues that can affect women, in particular during the perinatal period. I hope that members will see their input from June specifically reflected in this plan, and I look forward to working with colleagues as we move forward into the implementation and delivery phase. That focus on implementation is crucial. Our plan is comprehensive and ambitious but it is the work that we do now to deliver it that will make the difference. For some of these emerging issues that we've identified, we don't yet have all the answers. No single person or organisation does. And this is not a situation unique in Scotland. It is faced by populations across the world. We will therefore continue our close work with stakeholders and voices of lived experience to develop detailed implementation plans for necessary. And we will put forward comprehensive governance to ensure that progress is made towards each action. One of our commitments is for our third sector partners to be embedded in this process, and we will ensure that that happens. Their involvement will be fundamental to our success. We will also closely involve those with lived experience to ensure that our commitments will make a real positive lasting difference to people's lives and we will establish an equality stakeholder forum to ensure that equalities issues and a focus on rights are firmly at the heart of our approach. Finally, presiding officer, I wanted to briefly address the relationship between this plan and our parallel work on dementia, autism and learning disabilities. Reflecting the critical importance of each of these issues, we are currently working with partners to develop a separate national COVID-19 dementia transition and resilience plan. And this will build on our pandemic response for people with dementia and their families, as well as our three dementia strategies to date. Work is ongoing at a national and local level and across all sectors, and it will continue when we come to the implementation phase of the new plan. We also want to address the barriers and inequalities that exist for the autism and learning and intellectual disabilities populations. COVID-19 has shone a light on these issues. And we are developing an additional framework and will shortly start national engagement. We will involve people with lived experiences and organisations across sectors, and we will then publish the framework in December. Presiding officer, I will conclude by once again thanking everyone who has contributed to the development of this plan, our partners, our stakeholders and members alike. I look forward to working together as we face and respond to the further challenges that lie ahead. Our transition and recovery plan sets out how we will do that and it will ensure that the mental health of the people of Scotland continues to be a fundamental consideration in our COVID-19 response and I commend this to Parliament. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we now move on to questions on the issues raised in the Minister's statement, and I've got around 20 minutes for that. Loads of people want to ask questions, so if we could be succinct, that would be extremely useful. 
And the first question, of course, goes to Brian Whittle. Okay, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement? And I would like to caveat the questions that are about to follow by recognising the difficult decisions this government and governments the world over are making as we tackle this COVID-19 pandemic. And the Minister quite rightly highlights the severe psychological strain that the pandemic and the measures to combat the pa pandemic are having in the population as a whole. It has led to increased anxiety, loneliness and poor mental health, while restricting access to those things that can help to alleviate such feelings, such as access to family, loved ones and friends, or our ability to participate in activities which we use to de-stress. I would also highlight the plight of our teaching staff, who have told me that they are becoming overwhelmed with cases of pupils reporting what anxi with anxiety and poor mental health. They say their concern is that their attempts to help everyone they may miss something that leads to a much greater tra tragedy, which in itself compounds any anxious feelings that staff already have. So can I ask the Minister, given that CAMS was already under extreme pressure prior to the pandemic, what the Scottish Government will do to not just bolster the service, but also what the engagement with the third sector the Minister mentioned would look like, given that they may be better placed to deliver the specialised help in many instances? Can I also ask what the Scottish Government will do to support staff in their schools to deliver mental health support to the pupils that need? And finally, given the importance of regular contact uh, to positive mental health, what the Scottish Government will do to ensure that care home residents have regular visits from loved ones in a COVID-secure environment that is warm and welcoming? Claire Hawkey. I, th I thank Brian Whittle very much for his question there, and I will try to come to each of those in turn. Um, we recognise that um, for pupils going back to school, that for some of them may be a difficult time, but we also recognise that actually being at school helps some children in terms of their mental health, their socialisation, and provides them with support that they may, may not have had if schools were not open. But I appreciate that that can put stress on teachers. One of the things that we have committed to within the plan is um, in developing uh, mental health training resources for teachers by next year, by um, I think it's summer 2021, um, so that it gives them or the confidence to deal with some of the, the difficulties and issues that Mr Whittle has raised. And we are also committed to ensuring that there is a counsellor in a, a, available to each secondary school across the country. And we're on track for that to be delivered uh, by uh, autumn this year. Um, in addition, um, there is also mental health first aid training available to teachers and to other appropriate staff within the school. Yes, about the engagement with third sector, we absolutely want to work with the third sector in terms of supporting children and young people. We have some good examples across the country of third sector organisations already being embedded in schools. Place to be is one, exa uh, one example of an organisation which works very closely with schools in Edinburgh. And I have seen personally some of the work that they do to support children in schools and teachers in supporting those children. And the issue that he raises about care homes, I think, is a really important one and has been raised within this parliament on many occasions and addressed by the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport. I accompanied her to a meeting last Friday, I think it was, I'm sorry, I lose track of the days, I'm pretty sure it was last Friday, um, to uh, meet with a group of relatives whose family members were uh, in care homes and who were expressing their concern and distress about being separated from their their loved ones. Um, the Minister for Older People was also in attendance at that meeting. Um, I think the stories that we heard were, were quite heartbreaking. It is very distressing for relatives to be separated from their loved ones in care homes. I think we recognise that, but we also recognise that we have to protect the health of the staff and the residents within the care homes. However, the Cabinet Secretary did give an undertaking to keep under review the current guidance, and I'm sure there will be further information coming on that soon. Now I call Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I too thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement. This statement would have been more welcome back in March or April. The statement and transition and recovery plan lacks urgency, with many of the deadlines set for next spring and summer. The Scottish Government has not grasped the enormity of the mental health crisis which faces this country. And there are two specific areas I wish to raise with the Minister. Unemployment support. Thousands of people are facing unemployment now 
and urgently require mental health advice and support, not in March of next year. And on shielding, it is unacceptable for people with long-term physical health conditions and disabilities to have to wait until March of next year, whilst this government develops a plan for those shielding. The, the Scottish Government must prioritise the mental health of those facing redundancy and those shielding now, not next March. And finally, presiding officer, the transition and recovery plan refers to mental health services being restarted by March 2021. I'd be grateful if the minister could tell the chamber which mental health services have been stopped. Claire Hawkey. Thank you very much. Um, I think perhaps um, Mary Fee has misunderstood some of the the contents of the plan. These are th about things going forward. Mental health services have continued during the COVID pandemic, albeit some of them have had to stop. Some of, uh, for example, group therapy because of the COVID restrictions. We weren't able to physically have a number of people within a room. That just would not have been safe. But mental health services have continued. They have prioritised urgent and emergency um, presentations and people in distress. Mental health units have remained open, wards have been open, and staff have been uh, providing care and treatment for them. And mental health services are open at the moment. What we are looking at doing is providing almost a, a, a bespoke response to the, the situation that we currently find ourselves in and that we anticipate uh, we will find ourselves in in the coming months. We, you know, none of us are able to predict what will be the, the mental health impact across the country. So we are trying to ensure that right from um, tackling discrimination and stigma, right through to specialist inpatient services, that our care and treatment in mental health services are able to provide the care and the treatment and the support for people right across the country. Um, again, as uh, Mary Fee uh, raises the issue of shielding, yes, absolutely, we recognise that, that the people who were shielding were facing a particularly difficult time in a time when all of us were facing a particularly difficult time. And there was support put in for people who were shielding and they were ac able to access services. And we expanded some of our online and telephone services in response to some of the demands that were being made upon the service that couldn't be um, that couldn't be facilitated face to face. So things like expanding NHS 24 um, mental health hub to a 24 seven response, um, rolling out distress brief interventions come to right across reasons. the country. Um, so we have been responding to those and we will continue to respond to the mental health needs across Scotland. Okay, the, the front bench questions have taken far too long in questions and answers. If we want to get through any of these, we need to be a bit speedier. I've got no spare time to eat into this afternoon. So, uh, first of all, we have Emma Harper to be followed by Donald Cameron. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Minister how the Scottish Government has worked with health boards throughout the pandemic to pr promote the mental health and well-being of our incredible NHS workforce to ensure that they are supported in carrying out their vital roles on the front line of this pandemic? And remind Chamber that I am a registered nurse. Claire Hawkey. Uh, thank Emma Harper for that question. We've worked closely with partners across health and social care, including NHS boards, health and social care partnerships and local employers to ensure a range of mental health and wellbeing support is in place for our amazing workforce. And during the pandemic, a wide range of measures to protect staff wellbeing was put in place at the local level, sometimes site specific, sometimes across entire health boards. And this included dedicated private staff spaces to rest and recover, peer support, leadership development and coaching initiatives, mental health guidance and support and staff communication and digital tools. We also took action at a national level and we launched the National Wellbeing Hub, which signposts staff, unpaid carers, volunteers and their families to relevant services and provides a range of self-care and wellbeing resources. And we set up new National Wellbeing Helpline for the health and social care workforce, which is based within HS 24's Mental Health Hub. And that provides a 24-7 service to those who need psychological support, including in the light of the coronavirus crisis. And we also established... No, Minister, I have to stop you there. Okay. Terribly sorry about that. I know there's lots of information to come out, but members have lots of questions that they want to ask. So 
Please, um, if we could shorten that. Donald Cameron, followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, the Minister will know that before the pandemic, there was a mental health crisis in rural and remote parts of Scotland, such as the Highlands and Islands, which will no doubt be exacerbated by the pandemic. What specific actions are the Scottish Government taking to help organisations who support those suffering in rural communities during COVID-19? Claire Hawkey, quickly. So the Scottish Government provides funding to the National Rural Mental Health Forum for work to improve the mental health and wellbeing in areas of rurality. In our transition and recovery plan, we have committed to working in partnership with the National Rural Mental Health Forum to develop an approach to ensure rural communities have equal and timely access to mental health support services. And when the four DBI pilot areas were chosen, we deliberately included a broad mix of urban and rural locations. Thank you. Fulton McGregor, followed by Pauline McNeill. Uh, I th think we'll go on to Pauline McNeill, if that's OK, and try and come back to Fulton. Presiding officer, I'm now dealing with a young 19-year-old woman who made an attempt on her life after a GP twice refused a mental health referral, and she's still to get an appointment from Greater Glasgow Health Board. She says no one cares, not even the NHS. The Mental Health Foundation says there needs to be urgent measures put in place for that age group between 18 and 24. The Youth Parliament's called for it and Sam H uh, said that the government uh, have already have a commitment. Can the Minister tell me um, when this dedicated mental health service for this particular age group will be going live? I believe it's 2021. I just wanted more information if it was the first half or the second half. Claire Hockey. Uh, I thank Polly McNeill for her question. If she wants to write to me specifically on that case with the details, I would certainly be happy to look at that. Um, we, the community uh, mental health and wellbeing centres, which we are developing in conjunction with our uh, local authority colleagues, which uh, are for an age range from five up to 24. Um, there, some of those will be in place before the end of this financial year. And I'm certainly happy to get further detail for uh, Ms McNeill about the Glasgow area so that she's aware of what resources are going to be there for her constituents. We have found Fulton McGregor. And we'll have Fulton McGregor followed by Alison Johnson. Thanks, President Officer. And following on from the, the previous question there, I, I too welcome uh, the Scottish Government's commitment to introduce community mental health support services for children and young people. But can I ask the Minister if she's able to provide, uh, as well as a, an update on this, can she expand on what children and families should expect from these services? Claire Hawkey. The community wellbeing services will support children and young people to access support for their mental health and emotional wellbeing within their communities. We've allocated £2 million to local authorities towards the development of the children and young people's community mental health services. And we're allocating a further £3.75 million in this year's budget to specifically fund these services. The majority of services are expected to be in place for the last three months of 2020-21. And a further £15 million is expected to be available from 2021-22 onwards, assuming the services are fully in place. And a framework developed by the Children and Young People's Mental Health and Wellbeing Programme Board will support the development and delivery of these services. Alison Johnson to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, the emotional impact of the pandemic on those living and working in our care homes will be considerable and difficult to bear at this time, particularly when we see cases rising once again. So can the Minister outline what specific steps are being taken now to prevent a mental health crisis amongst care home residents who may have lost close friends and what specific mental health support is in place now for Scotland's skilled care workers who provide companionship support and maintain the dignity of many residents in their final hours and moments. Claire Hawkey. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. I thank Alison Johnson for that question. I think she, she uh, speaks of uh, the care home workforce as we all feel of them, that they are a highly skilled workforce and uh, are providing um, care to some of our most vulnerable residents. Um, as I mentioned in a previous answer, we set up the Staff Wellbeing Hub, which has, we have expanded not just or not only for NHS staff, but is also available 
available for care home staff and we did that in recognition of the difficult situation that they find themselves and that they perhaps do not have as easy access to occupational health services um, that uh, NHS employers, employees do and that service available online can then signpost them to resources that can help support them in a whole range of issues right through from emotional uh, support right through to financial support and in addition the uh, helpline that we, I mentioned in a previous answer as well hosted by the NHS Mental Health Hub is also available to social care staff. Alex Cole Hamilton, followed by George Adam. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Before the outset of the pandemic, a record number of children were waiting more than a year for first line mental health treatment. Can I ask the uh, Minister what the tailored programme of enhanced improvement support is and how it will succeed where predecessors failed? And we still don't have suicide statistics beyond 2018. So when will we see this? And can I ask the Minister to look again at improving, moving to a system where services can understand what is happening right now in real time and respond accordingly? Claire Hockey. Um, if I can take the point on suicide statistics that Mr Colham raises, my understanding is they will be published in November this year. They have been delayed essentially because of, of the COVID pandemic. Um, we are looking with ISD about how we can have more real-time um, suicide and self-harm uh, statistics so that we can work with the National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group uh, to uh, target more effectively interventions. So, yes, it certainly is, is, is on our radar. He asked about CAMS, and absolutely, um, we have identified that mental health is a clinical priority uh, for the government. We know that there has been a regrettable knock-on effect in terms of some of the timescales of delivery of care and treatment. Um, CAM services have continued throughout the pandemic, albeit there will be adjustments in how they're delivered, but services are now in the process of returning to previous levels of activity and dealing with any backlogs that have been uh, that have developed. Our transition and recovery plan sets out a number of actions to progress improvement on access to CAMS, including the implementation of our CAMS service specification and the restarting of our improvement programme of work, which will include targeted support. George Adam, followed by Annie Wales. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, the Minister previously mentioned digital mental health resources launched during the early parts of the pandemic. Can I ask what mental health support is available for those who are elderly or those who may not have access to online support services to ensure that there is no digital divide for those who need this support? Claire Hawkey. Uh, I thank George Adam for raising this very important issue. We understand that older people are more likely to experience circumstances which contribute to poorer mental health, such as poverty, isolation, loneliness and poor physical health. And the wider impacts of COVID-19 may exacerbate these circumstances further. That's why we have set out key actions to support the mental health and well-being of older people in this document. And we've committed to ensuring that older people have equitable access to mental health support and services and we will also work with stakeholders to support the development of peer support approaches to maintain good mental health that have um, emerged for uh, and among older people during lockdown. Um, we know that many older people have found this period particularly difficult as physical and distancing restrictions have made it more challenging to stay connected with their friends, family and loved ones and we will develop further actions to support people experiencing loneliness as a result of the pandemic and the associated physical distancing restrictions, building on the Scottish Government's existing strategy for tackling social isolation and loneliness. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Research from Glasgow University has highlighted the disproportionate impact of COVID on the mental health of black and minority ethnic communities. In particular, men from South Asian backgrounds have seen a 23% rise in mental distress during lockdown, compared with 6.5% for white men. With this in mind, what actions will the Scottish Government take to improve its understanding of the experience of our BAME communities in order to ensure that no part of Scotland gets left behind? 
Claire Hawkey. Well, I'm really pleased that Annie Whale has asked this question because it's, it's not been a, an issue raised, although I spoke of it in my statement uh, through questions from members. In the Transition and Recovery Plan, we've committed to establishing an equality forum to help us to identify the specific actions that we should take to address mental health inequality on an individual and structural basis. The issue of ethnicity is relevant in all aspects of this work. And as part of this, we will actively review what research is required nationally to further our understanding of the impact of the pandemic on the mental health of black and in ethnic minority communities. Uh, that concludes um, questions on the Minister's statement. Can I give apologies for not being able to take them to Rona Mackay, John McAlpine, Claudia Beamish, Liam Kerr and Neil Finlay. And can I ask members all to bear in mind again, it's particularly difficult when we have people coming in remotely too. And if questions are over long and answers over long, all it does is disadvantage fellow members. So we'll now move on to the next item of business.